Welcome to another webinar hosted by Wildlife SOS. Firstly, we would like to convey our wishes to everyone in India right now, struggling due to the pandemic. We wish nothing but well-being and good health to all. I'm Dr. Arun, the Director of Research and Veterinary Operations at Wildlife SOS. Wildlife SOS is a nature conservation organization based in India, dedicated to preserving and protecting rare and endangered wildlife in collaboration with the government of India. On today's webinar, we plan to learn about apparent conditioning or positive conditioning in captive wild animals, how beneficial this practice is for the animals and the people involved in animal care, especially for veterinarians. Today's guest is someone we are closely associated with, Ms. Mary Elizabeth Hampton, currently a team lead of Northwest Passage and Teton Trek at Memphis Zoo. She works with bears, wolves, and other native North American animals. She has previously worked with carnivores at the Little Rock Zoo for six years and marine mammals at the Shed Aquarium in Sigaco for nine years. In 2018, Ms. Hampton helped OLFSOS facilitate the introduction of positive reinforcement training for our rescued sloth bears. Good morning and welcome, Ms. Emmy Hampton. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. We hope you are well and things have started to look up in the United States. Thank you very much, Dr. Arun. Yeah, things uh, are looking up here, so I, uh, I hope they continue to go in a good direction for you all as well. Uh, all right, we are, yeah. we are looking forward to your presentation, Emmy Hampton. So our session today will be 35 to 40 minutes presentation by Ms. Hampton, followed with a 15 minutes question answer session. The audience can write down their questions in the Q&A session as we go along. Let us now begin with our session. It's all yours, Hampton. Okay, thank you. Uh, so again, um, my name is Mary Elizabeth. I often just go by my initials, Emmy, uh, so they will call me that later. And uh, I look forward to, to talking with you guys and to the Q&A. Uh, a little bit more about my background, uh, Dr. Arun did cover that. Uh, but I, I was one of those kids who loved animals. Uh, we had a few animals and pets at home, and I would go visit the zoo and fell in love with it. Uh, so I pursued a bachelor's degree in psychology with an emphasis <clears throat> in animal behavior. I always had an interest in working with animals and animal training. Uh, so then I did an internship while I was in college at the John G. Shedd Aquarium in Chicago and ended up being hired there and being on for nine years. Uh, when I left, I was at their senior trainer level. Uh, and then I moved to Little Rock, Arkansas and switched to carnivores. So I went from marine mammals to primarily bears. Uh, I worked with the cats and things, but spent a lot of time in the bear area. That is where I met and fell in love with the sloth bears uh, and had the opportunity to start working with Wildlife SOS. Uh, and then about a year and a half ago, I moved to the Memphis Zoo to take on the team lead position that I am in now, which he uh, introduced as, of course, and I work now with primarily with a variety of North American animals, including a few different bear species, uh, wolves, elk, et cetera. So I've worked with quite a variety of animals, uh, taken the opportunities when they were there, uh, reptiles, bears, carnivores, uh, birds, and the training techniques we use with them are all the same. So no matter what the setting is, uh, you can adapt it and use positive reinforcement and operant conditioning with all these different animals you see here. So first of all, why are we going to train zoo animals? Uh, so we break that down into two different things. We talk about the primary reason we train, uh, and that is mental stimulation and physical exercise. Uh, and we spend a lot of time working on what we call husbandry, which is their healthcare behaviors, um, and then their cooperative behavior. So in the zoo setting, uh, of course, a lot of these animals have uh, their exhibit space and then their behind the scenes space. So some of that cooperative behavior uh, it involves them coming inside so we can go out and clean their yard, put out toys, enrichment, uh, and then going outside. So we call that shifting. So that's part of their cooperative behavior, but we spend a lot of time working on their husbandry and healthcare behavior. So I will get into a lot of examples with that. 
Uh, and, and there are other reasons we train. We train certainly for education, uh, connecting with children, uh, connecting with school groups, and, um, and even co connecting, of course, with the adults and everyone who comes to visit the zoo. But we participate in a lot of research studies, uh, collecting samples for different veterinary or uh, thesis studies. People make requests, we do our best to accommodate for all of those. Uh, some animals are trained for work that really falls into more for the uh, herding dogs or um, horses and kind of things, which may not be the zoo setting, but it is a, a reason that animals do get trained. So I do leave it on that list for you. Uh, and then some animals are trained for entertainment. One way to make a big impact is to do a show uh, and, and be able to educate a large group of animals, or sorry, a large group of people uh, by showing off your animals and some of their natural behaviors. So getting a little bit more into the training, we talk a lot about the training ABCs, and this is the science of training. Um, before a behavior occurs, there's an antecedent. Uh, for us, when we talk about operant conditioning, that antecedent is a cue. So when we ask for a behavior, we usually have a hand signal or a verbal cue, kind of like asking your dog to sit. Uh, and then there, there is a behavior, uh, that is the sitting behavior. Uh, in the example I just gave, and then there's a consequence. So if the animal does sit correctly <clears throat> and you give, <coughs> pardon me, <clears throat> and you give your dog a treat, uh, that consequence is getting a treat. Uh, that's positive reinforcement. That's what we focus on the most in our training sessions. So this sequence is important. We talk a lot about the behavior, uh, the cue, the behavior, and the reinforcement. So I just wanted to put that out there because uh, I will refer back to that several times. The definition of operant conditioning uh, is the process, the process through which, uh, sorry, the process by which through learning free operant behavior becomes attached to a specific stimulus. That right there is the idea that we put it on a cue. Uh, the fundamental principle of operant conditioning is that is a behavior is that behavior is determined by its consequences. So if you think of that A B C, the C is the consequence what comes after the behavior and that determines if your behavior is going to uh, change. So a form, this is a form of learning in which the presentation of positive or negative reinforcers alters the rate at which responses are admitted. So that's a very technical definition there, uh, but we do, uh, we do refer to that a lot and that really breaks down the science of operant conditioning. And we'll talk about conditioning behavior uh, and this is, is where all of that comes from. So there are gonna be some terms I use a lot. When we talk about behavior, we talk about shaping behavior. So we're gonna build a behavior to look a certain way and we're gonna shape it through small steps. And we do that using reinforcement. Um, we don't use punishment in the zoo setting. We really focus on positive reinforcement, but it is important to know and understand uh, that punishment what punishment is, and that sometimes you can't control what is in the environment, and there is sometimes uh, something that can cause a behavior to decrease, which means technically it's being punished, but that doesn't always mean that you're doing it. Sometimes that is uh, the environment around the animal. So it's something to be aware of because it can decrease behavior, but what we focus on and work with is uh, positive reinforcement, which will increase the frequency of a behavior. So this grade breaks down uh, positive and negative reinforcement and punishment. So when we talk about the positive and negative here, it is not what you may initially think as being good versus bad. That is not the positive and negative here. What it actually means is pod positive means you're adding to a situation uh, and negative means you're removing from a situation. Uh, and then again, reinforcement is going to increase the frequency of a behavior. And punishment is going to decrease the frequency of a behavior. So this grid kind of explains everything for you. Uh, and I'll give you a nice little example for each section. So as I mentioned earlier, positive reinforcement means you're adding a desired stimulus after the behavior to increase the frequency of that behavior. So in this situation, asking your dog to sit and giving it a treat, you're positively reinforcing the sit behavior by giving it a treat. Now the rest of them is where it seems to sometimes get a little confusing. So negative reinforcement, what I think of there is um, you're gonna remove something from a situation in order to increase the frequency of a behavior. Uh, so the cleanest example I can think of, and I hope this works for you, is uh, for us, if I get in my car uh, and I don't put my seatbelt on, there's this really annoying beeping sound that happens. And so uh, the behavior, the beeping will not stop until I put on my seatbelt. So 
the behavior of wearing a seatbelt is negatively reinforced. So breaking that down, the change in behavior makes the aversive stimulus, in this case, that annoying beeping sound, go away and the increasing the frequency, frequency of the behavior in that situation. So the idea of putting your seatbelt on makes the annoying beeping go away. Your seatbelt behavior increases. Um, so that is negative reinforcement. And that works pretty well. Um, eventually you just get in the car, put on your seatbelt so that you don't even have to hear that annoying beep at all in the beginning. So that is an example of negative reinforcement. And again, that is a, maybe an aversive stimulus, but it's just an annoying beeping sound. Um, again, we try not to use that too much because it does evolve an aversive, but occasionally that does, uh, that does get used. We really choose to focus on positive reinforcement, however. Uh, now positive punishment, to give an example there, you're adding something, that's the positive, you're adding something to decrease a behavior. So this is that, uh, that example of uh, maybe a child uh, throwing a tantrum and getting a spanking. That spanking is positive punishment. So that is a, a pretty clean example there. Uh, negative punishment, however, is a little different. Uh, the example I think of is uh, if you ask your kid to come home uh, by a certain time, you give them a curfew uh, and they come home late, and then there's a consequence for that. So uh, for it may be uh, they come home late from a friend, so then you take their bike away for a week, uh, or uh, they are not allowed to, to drive or, <clears throat> or go to see that friend. So you're removing something they want, which is maybe the, the ability to go see that friend, to decrease the behavior of coming home late. Uh, so if they come home uh, late from curfew, and then you take away their bike, then they, that is negative punishment. Uh, so again, we focus on in the zoo setting on uh, po on positive reinforcement. And when I talk about this with staff and, and young staff and starting to apply these principles, what we really worry about or what we think about is what behavior do you want to increase? So you want to focus on that behavior you want, and that will keep you more inclined to use positive reinforcement. Um, and if a behavior is occurring more than it used to, then positive, then reinforcement is happening. Reinforcement increases behavior. Uh, so if you, even if it's a behavior you're hoping to not have, if it's occurring more than it used to, uh, then it is being reinforced. And then you're going to have to do some problem solving to work on getting that behavior uh, under control the way you want. But this is just the grid of the science. And again, we're going to focus on the use of positive reinforcement for the behaviors that we want. Oh, sorry. Uh, so, of course, animals are going to make mistakes. They may get confused. And definitely in the learning process, they're not going to do everything right on the first try. Uh, so how, the question becomes, how do you deal with incorrect behaviors? And I can tell you at Memphis Zoo, we uh, work a lot on redirecting behavior. So what that means is if I ask an animal to sit and they start to turn around or do something uh, else, I can just ask them for a different behavior. Uh, this keeps learning fun. You kind of redirect into a behavior they can get reinforced for. Um, and that way the, the, the learning continues in a positive way. And you can always come back to that behavior that they made a mistake on uh, and, and ask them for that later. We do use something called the least reinforcing scenario or an LRS, and that's a brief pause in training and then asking them for something different. So if you think back to that ABC I mentioned, so there's Q behavior reward, Q behavior reward, and your training sessions tend to have a nice little pattern to them and there's a bit of a rhythm. So Q behavior reward, Q behavior reward. And then if the animal makes a mistake, there's Q wrong behavior, a different ask, ask for a new Q. Uh, so again, there, there's just that pause in the rhythm of training, but you're going to ask them again for something different that they can then get rewarded for and put that training back on a positive, uh, positive streak. Um, and this reduces fr frustration for the animals. Um, you don't really have any, any frustration this way, um, and it keeps training fun. So you're always finding ways for the animal to, to succeed. So even if they make a mistake, you can redirect them into an area uh, or asking them for a different behavior that then allows them to um, get a reward and keep training fun and positive. And you just come back and revisit that mistake later. Sometimes you have to kind of break it down. Uh, other times maybe they blinked and they missed your cue uh, or something distracted them and you're just going to move on with the session, the training session. So the role of uh, trust and relationships is really important. 
Uh, we build strong relationships with our animal, and this is definitely a two-way relationship. You need trust from your animal to you, but you also need to trust your animal. Uh, this polar bear is a big, dangerous animal, and although we don't share space with them, um, they can still be a little intimidating, um, and you need them to trust you, and you have to trust them as well. Uh, so we work on building that trust reci uh, reciprocal relationship with our animals, and we do the majority of that through positive reinforcement. Um, and just spending time with them and getting to know them. So ways that you can build a relationship is certainly going to be different based on the species. For example, on the left here are wolves. We don't share space with them. Wolves are a dangerous animal, um, but our wolves came from a situation where they were around people very, uh, when they were pups uh, before they came to the zoo. And so they're very social wolves. Uh, they come over, if you sit down and hang out, they will come over and lay down in front of you uh, and lean against the fence looking for some scratches. So that's an easy way when we have new staff come in that they can hang out and get to know the wolves. And the wolves um, have the ability to walk away, of course, but if they come over and lay down, you can give them some scratches through the fence. Other animals, certainly uh, less dangerous there, uh, the goats, uh, like to climb and they're very interested. So these <laughs> these goats were all over me, um, but they just want to come over and hang out. Uh, and that was in a, a kind of a farm uh, situation. So they were very socialized and used to people. Um, and then that porcupine on the right is eating a little bit of a sweet potato. Uh, one of the ways to build a relationship with the animal is to hang out and feed them. Of course, animals are going to eat a lot uh, and they like their food. So if you hang out and just spend time and give them some free snacks now and then, uh, that will also start to build a nice relationship with the animals. Any animal you work with, it's important to know them very well. And you need to know them on multiple levels. Uh, so knowing a species natural history is important because of course a sea lion that lives in the saltwater uh, is going to need a different bit of training than um, a polar bear still lives near and around water, but definitely has a different environment. And of course you're gonna work with a sea lion or a bear differently than you will work with a raven, um, a wolf or elk or hoofstock. So knowing the species natural history is important. And then again, knowing an animal's individual history. So for example, um, this sea lion pictured here was rescued. She was orphaned as a pup, very small. And so she ended up being hand raised and bottle fed. So she has a very good relationship with people. If you had an animal come in rescued as an adult, uh, perhaps they were injured um, and they could not be re-released after rehabilitation due to maybe vision loss or something like that, but they were an adult animal, they're going to have a very different history. Uh, so both, both essentially came from the wild, but being hand-raised versus coming in as an adult, uh, they're going to have a different history. Um, of course, a sloth bear born into a zoo situation is going to have a different history than a sloth bear rescued out of the dancing bear trade. So again, knowing that individual animal's history and where they came from is important. Um, and obviously the animal's current situation is also going to be important. So what their current uh, holding situation is, if they're going to move to another facility uh, and what those goals might be. Um, so everything that we do with an animal, we look at the, the species from the big picture and the animal management setting, and then we move down to that individual animal and their history and what specific training they may need. So if they do have a healthcare concern, we're going to focus their training toward that. Uh, and then their situation. So if we need to uh, do an ultrasound with an animal, like do we need to modify their exhibit or their holding space to facilitate that? And those kind of things. Uh, we just kind of break it down one step at a time to create very specific goals for an individual animal. Uh, there are some more terms as I get into a lot of training examples here that we'll use. Uh, one of them is protected contact versus free contact. So protected contact means I have limited access to the animal uh, that I'm working with. So as I said, we don't share space with our wolves. We work with them protected contact. So through that fencing there, we can ask them to put their paw up so we can look at the bottom of their foot. Uh, we'll ask them to present their side so we can do a body exam and look at them from head to toe. But again, we're not sharing space with them. That is, cons that is what is called protected contact. Now free contact means we have full access to that animal uh, and they also have full access to us. So our sea lion training is free contact. I have some examples of that coming up. Um, and a lot of birds are, are free contact, uh, having them come over and uh, land on a perch uh, or uh, sharing space with the birds is going to be free contact. And then there's a lot of species that come into uh, a little bit of both. So you have like you'll have semi protected contact. So you have access to some of their body, maybe, but you don't share full space with them. 
So also, as we talk about training, uh, we I mentioned shaping, and we shape behaviors uh, from, from an early small process into the big final behavior. Uh, obviously, you can't just go train a blood draw uh, real quick and easy. It's going to take some time because there's multiple parts to that. And those multiple parts and the steps of that learning process are called successive approximations. So successive approximations are used in shaping to get to your final behavior. And that final behavior is going to have criteria. So criteria is a kind of the black and white definition of what we're looking for. So for example, if we're training um, an animal for an injection behavior, which I have an example here coming up, we want them to lay down, be calm and present that big muscle uh, up close enough that we can inject a syringe into their muscle for a vaccination or whatnot. Uh, so their criteria of what that final behavior looks like is really important. And having that behavior be the same and consistent all the time makes the animal able to achieve those goals and keeps it very black and white. It limits confusion or frustration or any of those things. Uh, the way we communicate that they've done it right is using something called a bridge. So a bridge actually came out of marine mammal training. And the idea came from uh, when a dolphin jumps, when they're at the height of that jump, that is the perfect time that you might want to reward the behavior. However, it would be very difficult to throw a fish to the height of that uh, jump and be uh, have your timing absolutely perfect. So what was created was um, the use of a bridge and it gets that term because it bridges the gap between that ideal moment of the behavior and the reinforcement. So in, in the case of a dolphin jumping, they use a whistle. Uh, it's a high frequency that dolphins can hear really well. And you blow your whistle at the height of that dolphin's jump, and then they come back to you, and then they get their fish hand-fed to them. Uh, so you're, you're bridging that gap between the correct behavior and the reinforcement. And now on a few other examples of a bridge include the word good. A lot of people use that in training. Uh, you'll hear some examples of that later. Uh, the whistle that I mentioned, and then a clicker. So if you've ever heard of clicker training, um, uh, then that is also an example of, bridge, of a bridge. Uh, there are a lot of things you can do uh, with a bridge, but those are the three most common that I think you, uh, that you may have seen or be familiar with. Um, again, one of the first things we do is target training, and that's one of the early steps for successive approximations. And you teach the animals to touch a target, and then you can, through successive approximations, shape a behavior. So this is a few examples of target training. With our sea lions, uh, sea lions are very curious and naturally tend to sniff or check things out with their nose. So it's very natural for them to come and touch your hand. And that is what we then trained as a target uh, behavior. So they'll come over and touch our, our fist. Uh, and then you can move your fist and they'll follow it. So the way that that is trained is you're going to uh, they come over and they usually naturally sniff, but you can touch them, feed them a fish, touch them, feed them a fish, touch them, feed them a fish. And then you go to touch them, but you're just a little bit away, uh, a few centimeters maybe. And they, they have that light bulb moment usually. And they're, they're like, oh, you didn't touch me. I can touch you. They come over and touch you. There you go. You've target trained them. Uh, and then you can start varying the distances and teach them to touch uh, and shape other behaviors from that point. Uh, you can teach an animal to target with different parts of their body. Uh, that elephant uh, is touching a target with its foot there. And then other, some animals are gonna touch with their nose. Other animals, such as the otter on the right and a lot of primates are going to naturally be curious and reach out with their, uh, their paw or their hand to touch a target. So you may have an animal who targets with their paw instead of with their nose. And that's a little bit of an animal preference. Again, knowing your individual animal and knowing the species and what they are going to uh, prefer to do or are more likely to do when you start training targeting. So again, once you've established this targeting behavior, uh, you can go on to more advanced targeting. Um, when they learn to follow a target, you can have them go up onto a scale. So if you, if you just offer that target, and kind of move it towards the scale slowly and steadily, they'll learn to come over and follow that target and then climb up on that scale and you can get a weight on them. It's voluntary that porcupine could walk off that scale whenever he wants, um, but he goes up there and sits and we can get regular weights, which is obviously a good baseline uh, for healthcare, knowing weights uh, for uh, body condition and that sort of thing. So that's one of the first things that we'll train after the initial target. 
And then of course you can get pretty creative. Uh, that C line in the middle has sort of transitioned from um, presenting the target to, or touching the target to then holding the target. So you uh, she was taught to hold that paintbrush um, and then target and follow the paintbrush around to do a little painting there. So uh, that's a good mental stimulation behavior for them. It kind of challenges the thought process. That is the animal that was uh, hand raised and rescued at a young age. So she's been in training for uh, 19 years. <laughs> um, and so you get creative about new ways to challenge and, and mentally stimulate the animals. So she has learned to paint there. Uh, the otter on the right, some advanced targeting there is a uh, duration. So teaching them to hold the target and focus on it um, because an otter doesn't naturally uh, sit still. They're, <laughs> they're a pretty busy animal. So teaching them to have patience and hold a target um, and just hang out while then you can palpate or touch the abdomen, uh, look at the rear flippers and the tail. So again, you're just getting into more advanced targeting. I mentioned that our sea lions are free contact, but of course a sea lion can get out of the water and follow you around. Uh, so this is an example of our, uh, what we call a protected contact exit. Because a sea lion can follow you out, we've taught her there to go touch that red target. Uh, and just hang out and allow us to leave. And then she gets nice reward and reinforcement once we leave the uh, habitat. So that allows us to exit safely. Uh, we also do that in a variety of ways and times. So it's not always predictable. Sometimes we'll go right back in and continue our training session. Uh, so we mix it up. Uh, that's an important part of reinforcement so that it's not always the exact same and completely predictable. Some animals do well with that, but most animals do really well with variety. Uh, so that again is a use of a target for a safe exit with a sea lion. Now getting into blood draw training. This is that husbandry training that is so important. Uh, and uh, blood samples can be collected from a lot of different locations. Again, you wanna know what is gonna work best for a species. Uh, in general or a specific animal, because some animals will do better with a front or back leg uh, versus another animal even of the same species. Uh, but you can draw from a lot of different places and I've got a couple of different blood draw examples here. Uh, this is an elephant blood draw. And, oh, my sound's on. Um, and so they're gonna draw from the backside of this elephant's ear. Um, now this elephant is being held there at the ear, but it actually has the ability to walk away. Uh, this is a large room uh, where she is just uh, was asked to come over and lean over and put her ear through the gap so that they could do this blood draw, but she has the ability to walk away. There's no restraint happening here. Uh, she's asked to target in a little bit closer because she started to relax and kind of lean away. So they asked her to target in a little bit closer uh, as they're getting that blood draw and she is just hanging out. Uh, and then you'll see here at the end, they uh, get the blood sample and then put the gauze up on there and she uh, she does great for it. Um, this is a routine sample that we do. I believe they were contributing to some research studies at that time, um, but so they would get samples a couple times a month. Uh, but again, the elephant has the ability to walk away there uh, and is choosing to participate. Uh, so elephant veins, you probably, <laughs> you vets out there know, those are pretty big and easy to get a sample from uh, on the ear. So that is the preferred location. Uh, for our bears, this is a grizzly bear here. And this is an early part of blood draw training. And so uh, in this session, we're introducing the buzz, buzzer or the clippers. So we kind of turn it on and she's presenting the um, underside of the foot. Now there she's getting a little bit of a shave on the underside, but that is not where we deep draw blood. Uh, this is the early stages of training. So just getting used to the, the clipper sensation. And then this video is our, our male polar bear. And he, uh, his, he has this blood sleeve where he can put his front leg out. So again, he's in his den holding space, but he uh, has the ability to walk away at any time. He can pull his leg out and leave. So here she felt the vein initially to look where she might want to run the clipper. Uh, and then he, uh, the, she's buzzing off a little bit of his fur there so we can get a clear look at the vein. Now, this is not an actual blood sample session. We got blood from him um, a couple days prior and then realized we had no footage of what his training looked like. So we just wanted to have uh, have some training session on film. Um, but again, you know, this is this polar bear is about 1100 pounds. Um, and uh, sorry, you have to convert that into kilos for me. Um, but he's a pretty big full grown adult male. Uh, I think he's 17 years old in this video and he uh, has the ability to walk away, but he's just hanging out. Um, he is getting fed, but if he wanted to walk away or avoid it, he certainly could. 
Um, so again, this is the blood sleeve setup. So we have safe access to get to the foot. Um, he's putting his foot out a little bit, but he's not going to be able to reach out and grab anyone. So this is kind of that semi-protected contact situation I mentioned uh, where we have some good access to him, um, but we're both safe. Us and the bear are both safe there in that situation. Uh, this video has a little bit of sound, so I'm going to let it play. Um, and, and I talk here a little bit about choice and control. This does look like a squeeze cage setup, um, and it looks like this animal is under restraint here, uh, but it's not. I'm going to go ahead and let this video play. Yeah. Um, this is a cheetah. So hopefully you heard that there, but um, that's one of those environmental conditions I mentioned that might punish a behavior. Um, and there was some thunder in the background, can't control that. Um, and it startled him. And so even though it looks like he's in a restraint situation, the front door to that uh, cage setup is open. So again, he can leave whenever he wants and he chose to leave there when the thunder rumbled. Uh, so that is, is perfectly fine. Uh, we like to give our animals as much choice and control as possible. So that means that they always have the option to walk away from their training session. And if they do, we'll hang out, see if they want to come back. Uh, if they don't, maybe we'll try them again later in the day uh, or, or try that training session on another day instead. So definitely um, giving the animals choice and control has shown us that they actually participate uh, better of their own free will uh, for sure. And if they have the option uh, to leave, a lot of times they actually end up staying more uh, than if you and being more comfortable with that door open than if you had had it closed. Uh, this is a, a pretty cool video here of a jaguar presenting its tail. Uh, most cats have a good vein in the tail to draw blood from. Uh, and so uh, here, she's actually already collected the blood sample. Uh, this is our vet at Memphis Zoo. And they wanted to relook at the stick site and just make sure uh, that it's not bleeding or anything. So he already gave a blood sample and then he's presenting his tail again. Excellent control there, sliding his tail under the gap. Uh, and then she was able to recheck uh, to make sure that the stick site looked fine. Another big area that we train for is injection training. And we utilize this for vaccinations, uh, maybe pre-sedation drugs. Uh, you can also give subcutaneous fluids if an animal needs it um, or administer antibiotics, pain meds or any other medication that might be requested by the vets. Uh, usually uh, we, uh, it looks very similar with mammals and the vets request a large muscle group for injections. So we tend to train either for shoulder or hip presentation. And this is the same whether you're working with a gorilla, a tiger, a bear, uh, that as long as that, that uh, shot can go into the large muscle group, most of the time they are, uh, the vets are happy with it. Um, I forgot to mention, um, but we do incorporate our vets very early in our training process so that we know what they want uh, because you could train a great shoulder present and the vets don't want it, they want the hip instead. So we definitely include them early in that process to make sure um, because we do most of the training sessions and they show up for those medical procedures. So we wanna train that correctly um, as they requested. So here is a tiger. Uh, this, this is a pre-sedation video. Um, so again, you can see the tiger is walking around, um, but she asked him to come over and lie down. Um, so he could get up and leave again at any point, um, but she does have the uh, syringe ready. And then we definitely adapt and put like different ports or access points like this that we need. Um, and she's able to reach in there uh, and inject him with the uh, requested medication um, and then uh, he holds for that and closing the port. So the really nice, full, complete behavior. And then you saw her using that whistle there. So the moment she blew that whistle, he got up and walked away because he knew uh, that bridge completed the behavior. So I do have a few more examples here. I'm trying not to run too long on time. Uh, so I'm going to get into a few other examples of uh, husbandry training, some enrichment novel training, and then a little bit of the work uh, with wildlife SOS sloth bears. Uh, so this giraffe footwork uh, on the left here, um, she is presenting her foot for an inspection. Uh, this is routine foot care that we do with most of our hoof stock. Um, and here you can see she's asked to present the foot and then the curl behavior and the trainer kind of helps assist into position with that. This giraffe is only a little over two years old uh, for this 
behavior and she's learned it and letting us check really well. Now you'll see a difference here when she presents her right foot. Um, there's a little bit of a, a difference there in the shape of the leg. Unfortunately, when she was really young, uh, that, that leg did get broken. Uh, we were able to, to fix the leg. Um, and obviously she's, she's walking around now a couple years later, but she does have very limited mobility there in that foot. And they're kind of discussing that in the video there, how she's unable to curl. Uh, so they have to adapt it. And then I thought that part's a little funny because she put her foot down early. They hadn't bridged the behavior yet and you can't hold on to a giraffe. So she just put her leg down. You can see there, there was a brief pause. Uh, and then they ask her to put her leg back up, which she does. So a little, probably a little confusion in communication there. Um, but maintaining that foot behavior, training it early with this animal because she did have a, a broken leg and they know that they're probably going to have some differences in the foot condition. Um, this was a real priority behavior for this animal in this situation. So again, catering to their individual needs uh, and knowing your individual animals and their priorities. This is an ultrasound session. So this video is actually the first time that we had um, both of our vets and the real ultrasound machine for the session. So there's a lot of variables here that we had to uh, condition, and we usually work with our sea lions one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, and in this case, we actually needed to add uh, two people. So we were kind of outnumbering the sea lion three to one. It took her a little bit of time to remember, I'm just focused on my trainer and these other two people are here, uh, but I'm gonna listen to the one, uh, the one trainer here. Uh, so you can see uh, she accepts the ultrasound probe. They're able to get a short video here. Again, this is the first time that we had done uh, the live ultrasound and this is training. Uh, we try and take the opportunities when we can to do proactive training. Um, if we're going to need an ultrasound. Also, one of the things we do as trainer is we make as many fake veterinary props as we can. So we'll use um, a little bit of a PVC pipe or um, a little rope that looks like, so it looks like a, an ultrasound probe with a rope attached to it. So the animals have seen that before the vets come in. We'll actually use just a, a binder, uh, like a, a cardboard binder so that it looks like that uh, the computer screen for the ultrasound and then have the rope and the fake probe attached to it. So she's seen all these little pieces of the training program before the day comes in when the vet actually wants to look at her. Now ultrasounding a sea lion is quite a bit easier because they're wet. So you don't have to worry about using any kind of gel. Uh, the ultrasound conducts without that because they are wet. Um, here, this uh, sloth bear is being trained for an ultrasound. And uh, she had to get used to the gel. And for her, that was actually kind of a big deal. Um, it took her a long time to be comfortable with the gel itself. Um, I think it, it always seemed to help if we warmed up the gel. So she didn't like that cool sensation. Um, and here in a moment, you'll see uh, she kind of looks down and sniffs and, and checks out what I'm doing. That's okay. We want the animals to be comfortable. There's not a trick here. She knows what's going on. Uh, we want her to be fully aware uh, of what we're doing. Um, and be comfortable with it. Uh, again, here she's working at her den door, but that hallway is open. She can leave and go out to her exhibit whenever she wants, and she's choosing to participate in the session. Uh, so I am offering her some cookies along the way, but uh, that's really not much if she didn't want to say um, she's already had her, her food that day. She's already had her main diet. Uh, so this is just a little bit of bonus snacks uh, for her training session. And you can see she's done really well there. Uh, for the gel application and the extra tactile around her abdomen. I thought this was video was really nice. Uh, this is actually some cold laser therapy being done with this tiger who had shown some arthritis and inflammation in his low back there. Um, so that little flashlight going back and forth is the cold laser. Uh, for this to be effective, they were given a time frame by the vets that they needed it for 10 minutes. Um, so that's a long time for a tiger to lay down or for any animal to just lay down and hang out. Uh, so what they did here is they had to use those approximations and start with just getting into the position and then maybe uh, maintaining the position for you know, five seconds, 10 seconds, and then really work to increase that behavior. Uh, what they got to with this, this tiger and this kind of final behavior, his criteria, uh, was to hang out and lay there and they got it to about two minutes. And so they would do it uh, or five times. Um, to uh, get to that 10 minute total that was requested for his cold, cold laser therapy. Uh, now they did see that this helped uh, and, and did seem to relieve some of the pain and some of the discomfort there. Uh, so I thought that was really cool. Uh, this is a friend of mine who shared the video. Um, you can see there, he ha she had a whistle um, and blew the whistle and you can see he pops up right away as soon as he hears that bridge uh, for his reinforcer, which are the, uh, the meat snacks there. So I thought that was a really cool application of training uh, and some novel treatment there. 
as a reminder, uh, everything you're seeing today with these animals, these exotic animal demonstrations can be done with your dog at home. Uh, so uh, this is my dog uh, and just learning a kennel behavior. Um, sometimes people complain they have to chase their animal or herd, herd them and corral them into a crate. If you spend some time asking your animal to go in, close the door, reward them, uh, and then let them back out, they learn to love their crate. They'll spend time in there. It's no big deal. Uh, so again, all these principles can be applied across species, including with your cats and dogs at home. Um, here's just a couple of fun videos. Uh, this video on the left here is a sea lion speed swim. They do have the ability to swim really fast, so we like to show that off. Uh, it's also good exercise for them to keep them healthy. And then uh, this video on the right, um, I definitely have the sound on there. Um, and that it, this is the sloth bear feeding behavior, but we're demonstrating it in a unique way. So again, we're showing that blowing and sucking behavior that is a natural feeding behavior, but we're using a harmonica to do that. That's a great way to connect with kids and get an audience's attention. And then you can get into explaining the, uh, the behavior of feeding uh, feeding and how they eat and talking about the environment, but you kind of get their attention with this novel behavior and then you can go into more of your education. So it's a, it's a nice fun way to do that. Um, it looks like I'm getting a little bit long on time here. Uh, so real quick, um, this uh, raven had learned to step onto the glove and it had learned to fly to a perch. So again, in the approximations here, those were two steps and then we were putting them together, teaching her to fly hopefully to your arm uh, over time. Uh, she does a great job there flying over and, and getting her snacks. Um, based on time, uh, this this video is teaching a sea lion to recycle. We talk a lot about preserving the environment for these animals and we have uh, help encourage them when we're educating a large, large audience um, in how we do it. So of course we don't want to throw a bottle in the water. Instead, we're going to take that bottle out of the water and put it in the recycling bin where it belongs. So again, that's a tool for education, uh, educating the public in our shows. Now I'm sure you're all familiar with Wildlife SOS. Um, I have visited and worked with them and helped start their training program, uh, particularly up at Agra. Uh, some more have been started down at Benergata. Uh, but one of the animals I worked with is Rose. <clears throat> so when I first went there and met them, they described Rose as a wild bear. Uh, she was very shy and avoided people. And I was told, uh, you can do what you want, but she won't do anything for you. And I love a challenge. Um, so I started working with her uh, mostly I focused on teaching the, the keepers there how to work with the animals and working with the vets and everyone. Um, but due, uh, she was the only one that I really focused on. And due to her medical issues, she had a negative association with the keepers in the den uh, because her front leg was caught in a snare. Uh, she had some pretty good surgery and treatment there. So it's very understandable. But one of the first things I did was give her choice and control. So I didn't lock her in the den. This is a picture of the first session I did. And she just sat in the den, very skeptical. She was shaking a little bit and didn't want to come over. I threw her a couple of treats and she kind of hung out. She was curious, um, but definitely skeptical. And I just showed a little patience with her, went and saw her several times. And she started coming in and trusting me. Her den door was always open. So she always had the option to leave. And by the end of the week, uh, she was coming over. She would be waiting for me. She could probably hear me talking um, and she would be waiting in the den and she had learned quite a few behaviors. So she learned to open her mouth for a dental exam. She learned an up so we could look at her underside. Uh, she learned to lay down and then start putting her paw out. That little square is a port to have her paw come out to try and do that blood draw that you saw with the polar bear on the top of her hand and she, or front paw. And she was starting to learn that. Um, and then the most important thing here is that she would do these things for me, which is great. Uh, but the really important thing is that she would also do them for her keeper. So of course I don't live in India um, and I pass them all off to her primary keeper and he has uh, been able to continue working with her and maintain these behaviors and make progress uh, well after I left. Uh, so again, sorry, I'm getting a little long here, but just uh, to wrap up, you know, we focus on positive reinforcement and operant conditioning and these apply with all species uh, and really it's really important to have a strong relationship and build that trust. And it leads to the less stressful management of the zoo animals. Uh, for the animals, we definitely want that less stress. And I'll tell you as a keeper, uh, it's a lot less stress to go in and give a vaccine in a training session than to have to restrain an animal or do a sedation. Uh, so thank you very much. I know I've run a little bit here, so I wanna make sure uh, we have them the, as much time as we can for uh, Q and A. Uh, my contact information is also up there. So if we don't have time to get through everything, feel free to contact me. Um, I really appreciate it. This is a passionate topic for me uh, and, uh, 
And so, yeah, thank you very much and take it away with questions. Thank you for that great insightful presentation, uh, Hampton. It was uh, uh, really mind blowing and then uh, very informative. Positive conditioning has helped our sloth bears uh, here massively. And your points on uh, ABC of uh, uh, apparent conditioning, how to deal with uh, incorrect behavior, the role of trust and protected contact versus free contact, successive approximation criteria and how to shape up the behavior, use of uh, white, I mean, whistle or even uh, clickers uh, to bridge our communication with animals. And uh, it is over uh, uh, expectations of like getting the animal to get injected themselves. So such kind of injection training, blood draw, and apart from the ultrasound training, cold laser therapy is a really, really uh, practical uh, uh, help for any uh, zoo veterinarian. So I really appreciate, I hope uh, uh, every uh, individual audience would have enjoyed this uh, presentation. And I really like your uh, 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 fundamental of uh, Q uh, behavior and uh, reward. So uh, I feel uh, that concept uh, hold good for every other uh, 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 behavioral expectation from animals, uh, in fact, even people. So uh, Q <laughs> behavior and uh, uh, reward. So uh, we, we can now begin our uh, uh, Q&A session. Uh, I request my colleague uh, um, to start the same. If we are unable to answer your questions right now, we will email you the answers. Uh, now, uh, I would request uh, Ms. Sandhi or I mean, uh, Anisha to take over the question and answer session. Yes. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Arun. Uh, again, Mary, thank you again for your presentation. That was definitely very, very interesting. So we have a few uh, questions lined up for you. Uh, so the first question is, uh, uh, what if the uh, animal does not listen to you? What do you do then? So if the animal doesn't listen, um, we talk about... Uh, that's when we get into a lot of problem solving and you look at what the animal's motivation is. So are they uh, full? Are they not hungry? Did they just have their breakfast? And so they're not paying attention. Are they nervous? Um, are they in a social setting? Some animals do really well um, in a group and they actually don't like being separated. So bringing them in by themselves to work one-on-one -on -one doesn't work for that animal. So maybe you need to bring in uh, the other animals that they're comfortable with, and then they can relax and train. Um, you do have to work with multiple animals at one time, but sometimes that is a better option. Um, again, it's a lot about that relationship building and knowing the animal's history. So, you know, Rose is an example of, uh, you know, she had a lot of procedures done to work on that, that uh, amputated uh, leg or paw and so she was very nervous of the den. So she didn't want to participate at first. She would look at me, but she'd wander away. And then she'd come back and look at me again. So it was a lot of patience and just hanging out and spending time before she was comfortable enough to come in and take food. Uh, we've worked with tigers that didn't want to come over at all. And we actually just sat and hung out with them. Um, one of our keepers was reading a book to the tigers to get her used to, uh, one per tiger in particular, to get her used to the sound of a voice and being comfortable with that because uh, she was very nervous and skeptical when she came to our zoo. And we just had to show a lot of patience and kind of hang out um, and watch from a distance and see what she seemed to prefer. Um, so there's not an easy answer there. Uh, if you have a more specific thing, I could, I could certainly help address that in the future. Um, right. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> All right. So uh, the, another question we have for you is how do you draw blood from reptiles? Um, I have... I have seen only seen blood drawn um, once or twice with a reptile, and it was a pretty large lizard. So they blew, uh, drew blood from the tail. Uh, I think there's a vein on the underside of the tail. That's a, actually a vet question. Um, but uh, but since I haven't I haven't done that as much, um, I've just kind of heard about it. I think that would be a veterinary question, um, and uh, that's the only one I've seen, and it may vary by species. Right. Um, okay. So another question we have to use, uh, 
uh, which is the species that requires the most amount uh, of, of that's most difficult to train or that requires a unique training technique? Um, I think that it may, that's a good question. Honestly, my first thought would be uh, reptiles like snakes um, because they only eat at a, a rare frequency. Um, so the way that you train them, you have to, for me anyways, you would have to be a little more creative about what is rewarding and reinforcing for them. So if you, they only eat once a week um, and they get one bite of food, uh, it's hard to do a lot of approximations, but sometimes you can reward behavior um, by setting up a situation they like. So one of the things uh, that zoos here have started doing a lot is we um, don't handle the venomous snakes and we want them to voluntarily uh, move out of their enclosure so we can clean it. So you can um, actually like build an additional uh, little uh, carrier and have them shift essentially and go into a separate carrier and they get fed in there and then you can clean their enclosure. But again, that's once a week. So sometimes that's a little different um, and you have to find what is reinforcing for the animal that may not be food. So that is what I find to be more challenging uh, and where I have less experience. Um, but it may be different for someone who knows reptiles. They may have a lot of ideas. It's just not my forte. Right. Um, so we have a question from uh, another vet that works here. Uh, so uh, if you have experience with big cats like leopards, uh, how long do you think uh, it takes to train uh, big cats? Yeah, big wild cats like leopards or tigers. Um, I think that's going to depend on the individual. So our, like I mentioned, we had one tiger, um, a female who came in that was very skeptical and didn't uh, want to hang out with us. And she took several months of spending time with her, uh, literally reading a book to her to get her used to our voice and get her relaxed and comfortable. Uh, and then once she was comfortable with us, she started training really well. And she learned um, all those different behaviors that I demonstrated. But that initial phase was very slow with her. Um, I think cats take longer to train than bears. Um, I think that their attention span is a little bit different. Um, and, uh, I don't want to use them necessarily, but that stereotype of a cat versus a dog and how much effort they're going to put in kind of applies from big cats to bears as well. And so I think you could train, uh, we've trained mouth open dental exams, side presents and tail presents. The tail is a challenging one because you're communicating to them like that Jaguar to put their tail out in a small spot. Uh, and that is one of the things that is a little bit harder because they're having to put a lot of effort into the way they move their tail and learn really good tail control. Um, so there's not a short answer for how fast it can happen, but it can happen. Right. Um, so uh, another question we have for you, uh, considering your work across several zoos, which come under the Association of Zoos and Aquariums, how important are accredited organizations for conservation? I'm sorry, how important is what? Uh, accredited uh, organizations for conservation? Um, I think it, that they're very important. You know, uh, as uh, the facilities that I've worked at are all members of the uh, Association of Zoos and Aquariums and they hold us to a very high standard um, and that's for animal care um, and conservation efforts. And so, one of the things like we demonstrate, or I had a couple of videos there with our sea lions is, you know, one of our sea lions came from the wild as a rescued pup. She wouldn't have survived um, because her mom, she was rescued so young. Her mom uh, didn't have the time to teach her the skills to survive in the wild. So she becomes an ambassador for the species. So we talk a lot about, uh, about conservation in our shows and we can impact, you know, a thousand or more people in a show by talking about, uh, you know, not using single use plastics and um, the importance of recycling. And uh, we talk about the trash, uh, uh, I'm blanking now, but the large trash uh, plastic uh, thing in the Pacific Ocean, you know, that's a very large, just waste that has gathered there. Um, and so I think, I think it's very important to, to educate using your animals and teaching people about the conservation of them in the wild, uh, talking about sloth bears and the dancing trade and, you know, why it's important that they exist um, and, and their larger uh, role in the ecosystem and the environment. And so I think that's a really important part. And AZA 
uh, wants us to do that, of course, um, but it's also initiated by our, by ourselves and how important we think it is, I think, as individuals and how much we promote it. All right. Um, so uh, the next question we have to use, uh, how do you train a blind animal? So I've, I have worked with a blind sea lion um, and uh, you change your cues. Instead of being a visual cue, you start to use your verbal cues. So if you ask an animal to turn, usually using a hand signal, uh, instead you just use the word turn. Um, and to teach the targeting for the sea lion that we had, uh, we actually put some beans in the, uh, in the target so that when you shook it, they could hear it. And so they were following that target by sound instead of by vision. Uh, and it worked really well. He would follow us around. Uh, you need to be a little bit more proactive um, and uh, desensitizing the, uh, the sounds and things that they might hear that might startle them. Um, but yeah, and you use a lot of tactile cues as well. So instead of um, targeting and, and you can shake that target to have them find it, but then sometimes you might need to try and get them in a position where you can touch and touch their foot with your hand and say target so that they learn that that touch means to lift their foot. Mm -hmm. um, and so you use a lot of touch and auditory cues instead of using the visual cues. All right. Um, so another question we have is, uh, is there a difference in training procedures of solitary animals and animals that live in groups? The principles are apl applied the same way, um, but working in a group is a lot more challenging for the trainer. Um, if uh, I, I have a video of working with two sea lions um, uh, and I was just not gonna have time, um, but you have to split your attention. So it puts more on the trainer uh, in terms of and how how you how much you're paying attention to and how much you're managing, um, but it also means that you're training the animals cooperatively. So say you're uh, going into an enclosure with, you know, three or four different primates or maybe a group of otters, uh, you end up training them as a group and you want everyone to participate. And sometimes you're going to have that animal who won't. So you're going to split your attention between reinforcing the animals who are all good. Um, and kind of trying to ignore and then redirect that attention of the animal who's not interested um, or is, is being a distraction. When we work with a group of animals, one of the things we encourage is teaching them all a location uh, where they can specifically sit. And so it's kind of like going to a dinner party if you have like a seat with your assigned name in front of it, but we make it the same for them every time. So we have eight sea lions at Memphis Zoo. And if we're working two of them, they always know if they're on the right or the left based on which animal they're next to. So you're teaching them to cooperate with each other, pay attention with you um, and, uh, and, and kind of manage all that as a group. So it is possible. It's going to be a little bit slower because there's so many distractions, um, but it, it, is a, it is possible. And, uh, and it's actually, it's really cool when it comes together. It's very impressive. Um, it's good for the animal's cooperative behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's one of the things I actually really enjoy. Right, wow, that does sound very interesting. Uh, so we have time for two more questions. And the next one is, uh, what is the ideal age to start training in captive wild animals uh, or large fields? Uh, what was the last point or, or what? Uh, what is the ideal age to start training uh, captive wildlife, like large felids or, yeah, just. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I would say if I would start training as early as I can, honestly, if the animal is eating and they're healthy um, and they're not going to be released, uh, you know, you're not trying to release them out into the wild, um, then I would start training them as early as they will, will sh they show an interest. Uh, the only difference is we don't train and work with animals that we want to re release and uh, rehabilitate and release um, because we don't want them to associate humans as a good food source. Uh, so if, but if an animal is born into a zoo, uh, we had a couple of sea lions born um, at the Memphis Zoo three years ago. So we let their mothers raise them. But once their mom started to wean them off of milk and kind of kick them off, um, we started feeding them fish and started their training uh, as they were weaned. Um, and that's the way we, we work with a lot of animals. So let mom raise them. And then, uh, as soon as they show interest, start training them. Right. Um, so my last question for you is, um, with, uh, many folk for zoos and against zoos, uh, what would you, uh, what would you say to someone with such a dilemma? So I think 
Um, obviously, I've been in the zoo industry for a long time, and I feel like we have a very important role. The animals that I work with are ambassadors for their animals in the for their uh, counterparts in the wild. And so a lot of what we know about animals in the wild um, did start with the zoo. Uh, we've also done a lot of work and research with zoo animals that has helped animals in the wild. Um, for example, uh, marine mammals are often often a very contested, uh, you know, people are for or against them being in, in human care. Um, but we learned a lot about marine mammals uh, and then we're able to apply that to the wild. And when there are populations in trouble, like the beluga whale population that uh, is at risk um, in the Arctic, when the vets were trying to go out and do studies on them, they thought they were going to have to do these really invasive procedures to get some samples. And we were able to contribute and tell them, actually, you can get a fecal sample uh, pretty easily. Uh, we do it voluntarily, regularly with our animals. Um, and so there's a relationship there. And I think it's important for researchers in the wild to talk mm -hmm. to and utilize the zoo community and the rescue community, uh, because things overlap there that you might not initially think about. Um, and these animals are ambassadors for their animals in the wild. It's about um, using these, uh, these opportunities that we have to, to facilitate education and teach a love for animals. Uh, the zoo animals now uh, come in as rescues. Like I mentioned, that 19-year-old sea lion, she was rescued from the wild. We provide a home for them all the time. Uh, any grizzly bears or black bears that you see in a zoo in North America, in an AZA zoo in North America, are uh, orphaned in the wild, and we provide them with a forever home. That's 20 plus years that we're going to have that bear, um, and they're orphaned for a variety of reasons, uh, whether their mom got hit by a car or was a nuisance bear that had to be um, re, uh, relocated um, and or, or whatever the situation may have been, uh, we are a rescue facility for grizzly bears and black bears um, as an AZA zoo. And not everyone realizes that if you see a cub, it's because their mom unfortunately didn't survive in the wild and they were abandoned. And then we provide that home. So a lot of zoo animals now are coming in as rescues or we're maintaining our own population. Um, they aren't coming from the wild. So I think that's an important difference that not pe people not, don't always know now. Right. Uh, so I think we're uh, out of time. And again, thank you again, Mary. And uh, I think I'll just hand the session over to Dr. Arun again. Thank you for the wonderful uh, uh, question and answer uh, session also, uh, uh, Hampton. So thank you once again for making time for Wildlife SOS in order to share your knowledge with us. Would you have any message before we sign off? Um, I, you know, I really appreciate the opportunity to share this. This is stuff that I love um, and I'm very passionate about. And uh, I hope COVID comes, calms down and uh, we get this stuff under control so I can come back and see you guys again. <laughs> <laughs> brilliant, brilliant. Thank you, Ms. Uh, Hampton. We look forward to having you again at Wildlife SOS. To everyone listening, please do join us uh, on our next webinar. To find out details of the next webinar, please do keep an eye on our social media. To, more about, to know more about Wildlife SOS, visit our website or email us on info at wildlifesos.org. Thank you once again. Take care. And we urge everyone to stay safe. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye, everyone.